So it's almost natural for us to want to bring glory to ourselves. A lot of times it's like, you know, it's kind of like this, right? Like, no, really don't, you know, don't, don't say good things about me. But really, we, we kind of like that too, right? Especially when something good happens. I vividly remember my, uh, you know, if you look at me, you, you wouldn't look at me and say, man, I bet Edward is an awesome high school football player. Uh, nobody really said that, but I had some high moments, and I'll never forget my, my best game <laughs> ever. My kids, you know, I, I had that one game, you know, like I scored two touchdowns, and I forced a fumble, and I had a fumble recovery, had a bunch of tackles. I think I even had a, 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 punt, a, a punt return that was, that was really good. And I didn't know Jesus at the time in my life, so there was, there was no pointing the glory anywhere but to me. I, I remember, you know, running into the end zone, my two touchdowns were like, you know, long touchdowns. And I remember just being like, you know, just, man, come on, you know. That's all I knew, you know, that's all I knew. I, I tried to shine it on myself as much as I could. Fast forward to my walk with Jesus. I met Jesus when I was 20. Many of you know my testimony. And thankfully, by his grace, I've, I've grown a little bit over the years. I'm, I'm not as motivated these days. I share this pretty openly to have a big church crowd. I'm, I just love our church. That, that We got some big energy in the room. The chins are in the room today. So, you know, the heavy in the room today. Um, the, the chin, one of the Chin brothers got married this week, so celebrate that. So, so glad to have you guys here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not as fixated on having a lot of followers or clicks or whatever on social media. But for most of us, that really takes going against the grain. Most people out there, mo most of the people, quite frankly, that our young people are striving to, you know, I don't know, they're, they're like role models, are, are, are not trying to deflect glory away from them. Glory, at least from a biblical perspective, it means something that's weighty or important or significant. That's what the, at least the Hebrew word glory, that's what it means. And I want to be important and significant and weighty, although not in pounds. The problem is that goes against the flow of what we were actually made for. We're made for some glory that's not ours. We were made for glory, but not our own. Here's the main point. We were made, we were created. Our very existence is for the glory of God, the weightiness and significance and importance of God in our lives. So let's cheat a little and look at the back of the book, the last book in the Bible, Revelation. That's not the main text this morning, but I just want us to catch a glimpse of what it means to be made for God's glory. L listen to this from Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, again, whenever you think of glory, just think of importance. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who's that? Jesus, of course. And him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Everything that God created, everything that he created, he created for his glory. I've talked to young people throughout the years and, and even adults who are like, well, isn't that selfish and prideful? I mean, you, you can't say to God, who are you? Who are you to take all the glory for yourself? You know, ask Job and many others, right? So I can't explain that, but he's God, he's perfect, he can't lie. There's no shadow of darkness within him. So somehow in his absolute perfection, it's not pride at all. Our lives aren't really about us at all. Our lives, again, are just created for God's glory. Now, Moses, as far as my hero, I was kind of an Old Testament guy when I was in seminary. I love uh, some of these uh, Old Testament heroes and saints, and Moses is my hero. He was consumed with a passion for God's glory. At least eventually he got there. So there's hope for us. He wasn't always like that. He was a liar and a murderer. <laughs> He did a lot of bad things in his life, but eventually he got it and was consumed 
with a passion for God's glory to see it and understand it and respond to it in the way that he was created. So if you have a Bible with me, turn to Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus 33 and 34 for a few minutes this morning. And let's listen to what God has to say to us about being created for glory. So as you're turning there or waiting to see it on the screen, let me give you some background to the story. So Moses receives the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. From chapters 21 to 31, Moses was receiving, his, he's up in the mountain, there's a cloud surrounding him, some supernatural things going on, he's hearing from God, he's, he's getting the, the message here, God's scribbling on the tablets, these 10 chapters. Chapter 32, verse 1, the people grow impatient. I mean, Moses is up there for like hours. And they get impatient. You ever get impatient waiting on God? I mean, Moses certainly understood that, right? What's Moses, 80 years old at this point? He was waiting for 40 years. Long time. He understands waiting. I get really impatient. Like, I prayed for it last night, God. Like, aren't you going to answer? So the people begin, they're so impatient that they're like, you know what? Maybe we need another God. <laughs> Maybe we need another God. So they start worshiping another God. And, of course, the real God was not happy with that. So he was going to destroy the people. But Moses interceded and he asked God to have mercy, and God did have mercy. But then Moses went down from the mountain to see the people, and his anger burned. And he's like, God, maybe we should destroy these people. He got so mad. Can you imagine? He, he had the, the tablets of stone that God wrote these ten words on, and he just smashes them. He's so angry. Then Moses calls on all those who fear the Lord. He's basically like, okay, here's what we're going to do. All of you who fear the Lord, all of you who are ready to walk with the Lord on this side of the line, and all of you who want to worship a false god, didn't say it in that word, but over here. And he commands the faithful ones, to kill everyone else. And the Bible records that 3,000 people died that day. So Moses was pretty serious about the glory of God. And I can't really explain all that. I don't have a great answer for how, how does God allow that to happen. But I can say this. The nation of Israel is being established. His people is being established. And they're setting a foundation. And God is doing something radical to make sure that it's clear that he is God. And so there's something about that that made it extra serious. And we see that throughout scripture as well. Then Moses is like, man, I am not sure, God. <laughs> I mean, some supernatural things are going on. He's like, man, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I need to know. Yet God's confirming with Moses. No, I've called you. I've still called you. These are your people. I'm going to send you. I'm going to fulfill these promises. And Moses is like, I'm not sure, God. You've got to really make it clear and so he's like, God, you've got to assure me that you're going to be with me. And that's the backdrop as Moses approached the Lord again, but with an unimaginable request. Exodus 33, 18, we pick up the story there. Then Moses said, now, God, show me your glory. And to us, we may not think about that as being an unimaginable question, but it really was. Think about the implication of what Moses was asking. It's staggering. Moses was literally saying, God, reveal yourself, show yourself to me, which again, to us, we're like, well, we kind of say that kind of thing in church a lot. You know, God, you know, we kind of say that. But it's, it's really amazing. Like the God of all creation, God, reveal yourself to me. May God ignite a similar desire within us to really know God and his glory. So the Lord's response here is even more staggering and deserving of our utmost and careful attention. Verse 19, and then the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness. So the Hebrew word for good is, is tov, but it's, like, it's basic. Think about how do we know what's good? You have to have some standard. And so goodness is the center of who God is. It's not like, you know, today we had some good food already. Tonight, maybe you're going to have a good meal. Maybe I, I love ice cream, you know, and ice cream is really good. That's not the way that God is good. God is good in the sense of moral perfection. It's his holiness. So God is first and foremost 
holy. He's good. Really kind of the same idea. The center of who he is. So he says, I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's glory again. The word translated glory has the primary meaning, as I've said over and over again, of weighty significance, importance. Worthy of high honor. Thus to have glory is to be weighty or important to oneself or others. God's glory is, is particularly God's visible manifestation to humans. Notice these manifestations here in verse 19. I will cause, I myself will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. My holiness, my moral perfection. That is so different than anything you and I know. We just don't know anything like that. I mean, think about the most perfect, holy, moral thing. <laughs> like, what comes to your mind? I, I don't even know. A beautiful sunset? Maybe you're in an airplane and you can just see the, the world? I, I don't even know. Like, what is holy in our world? And then he says, I will have mercy. It Really, this should be grace. I will be gracious. I will, it's, it's translated the word mercy, but really it's the word that's usually translated gracious. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Gracious. I will give good gifts to those who don't deserve them. I want some of that because I need that in light of God being holy and perfect, moral perfection. In light of that, the only thing I could possibly receive from that God is something I don't deserve. And then I will have compassion. And compassion and mercy in Hebrew, it's the same word. So you think of compassion or mercy. I will have compassion. I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I will hold back what they don't deserve to those who I choose. Notice, as the story unfolds, how God adds to his glory in the next chapter, chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. He repeats that he's compassionate and gracious, but then he adds a few things. Notice what he says here in, verse, in chapter 34. And then, as he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, or merciful and gracious, slow to anger, isn't it interesting? Right here, even though 3,000 people just died because they were worshiping a false god, and yet the character of God is not anger. It's God, yes, he's the God. He's, he'll be ven we don't take vengeance to, our, to ourselves, right? Because God is ultimately the judge. But it's not that he's just filled with vengeance. In fact... This is the very first time the essence of God is revealed in Scripture, which I think is significant. This is the first description of what God is like in Scripture. And in my opinion, in my opinion, this is a somewhat of a formula throughout Scripture. So we have this here in the Pentateuch. We see it in the prophets. We see it in Psalms. And we're going to see it here in just a minute in Jesus. So what is God like? He's compassionate and merciful, gracious and merciful. And slow to anger. And yet, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet, all that's good, yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So what's going on there? Uh, this isn't really something that I want to spend a whole lot of time unpacking, but it doesn't mean what it seems to be saying. It doesn't mean, God only ever holds individual people responsible for individual sin. But what happens when you live in a home, are there, does anybody live in a home where there are three generations? Okay, so nobody, right? If you live in a home with three generations, then what do you have in that home? You have three generations of sin. And it is most likely when you live in a home where there's three or four generations that those sins are going to be passed passed down, not held guilty for someone else's sin, but those sins are passed down. Some of you, your father or your mother was like something, and you said when you were a teenager, I'm never going to be like my mom or dad. My, I love my dad. Dad, if you're ever watching, I love you. My dad was my best man in my wedding. 
man, my dad's a little weird, though, <laughs> you know. And, and he just did, you know, and, and when I was a teenager, you know, we had a basketball court. My house was kind of a place to hang out. Trust me, none of my friends wanted to go inside my house. And I would, I would say to my friends, first time friends ever to my house, I'd be like, hey, if you see my dad, <laughs> if you see my dad, just, just, just go with it, you know. I know him, I know. If he just looks at you and stares at you, you know. And now I'm a dad, and I have a 20-year-old son, and almost 18, and almost 16, and, you know, I don't know that my sons are, like, saying to, saying to their friends, you know, hey, man, you guys need to come over, because, you know, man, hanging out with my dad's cool. I remember, you know, not too recently, or not, not too long ago, um, there was a girl that was, and it wasn't, it wasn't associated with either of these guys, but there was a girl that came over associated with Elijah. And I just remember, I had to fight inside urges to say weird things. Like, not, not that I'm trying to come up with weird things, but it's just in my nature sometimes to have a weird question. I, don't, I have no idea where I, that comes from, but I do. So anyway, you understand the point. Right? That's kind of a funny way. We all can kind of relate to that in some way, right? I, I believe that is the point. It's not that God is going to hold the sin of your father or grandfather against you. That makes no sense. Again, biblical principle of interpretation. Interpret things that are clear, clearly, and the things that are not so clear, make sure that you're using the whole of Scripture. What, what else does the Bible say about sin? And use all that to determine, okay, well, this... It can't be at face value maybe what this seems to be saying. I hope that makes sense. If you have questions, we can talk more later. I'm not trying to skirt it. So God's glory can be summarized like this. God's goodness or his holiness, his graciousness, compassion, abundance of loyalty to his promises, abundance of truth, forgiveness of sin, and his punishment of those who are guilty of sin. A lot of people these days don't, they like that front stuff, but they don't like that back part. This is God's essence. It's who he is. He is supremely weighty and significant and important. And he's worthy of highest honor. Because of the significance of his glory, God wants us to really understand this. So he gave us some help in his son Jesus so that we could see a little more tangibly what his glory is like. In John 1.14, the apostle John said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling or he tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Doesn't that sound like Moses? <laughs> It's not the exact same formula, but the components, the ingredients of glory are certainly there. They're not all there always in the same order or in the same way, but we see the same things. He's full of grace and truth. And, and I've said this before. I have, a, I have a tattoo of my daughter's name, Grace, and, and of my son's name, Truth. And Emmett will always think that this is because he's lesser and that, that Karis is more important, but um, I, I made sure that grace is a lot bigger. Because in my opinion, not everybody's going to agree with this, but this is the kind of church we want to be, at least this is the kind of church I want to be a part of. I, I want to, if we're going to, it's never possible to be totally I in balance, right? So if we're going to be out of balance, man, let's be filled with grace, in particular towards people who don't deserve it. We're going we're gonna to be truth. We're going to be filled with truth, too. The truth is important. Li we've got to live according to the truth, right? But, man, we, we need a lot of grace and truth, a lot of grace and truth. And Jesus was the perfect embodiment of that. How about Hebrews 1, verse 3? Love this verse. We could spend all day in this verse. We won't, but I'll read it to you. The Son, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. It's like if you have a coin and the impression of that coin, you, you see the face of the, the, the president or whoever it was on that coin. And it's like Jesus is on the coin. And when we see the coin, we see God. That's very imperfect, crude way of saying it. But that's kind of what the writer is saying here. Jesus is the radiance. He's the impression of God's glory. And listen to this. The exact representation of his being. This is one of the strongest verses in the New Testament that is declaring Jesus as God. 
He is the exact representation of his being, of the being, uh, God. He is God, right? Listen to this. Only God can do this. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin. So you know he's talking about Jesus, right? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. It is finished. It is finished. Brothers and sisters, seeing and understanding God's glory is not enough. We've got to respond to his glory. Notice how Moses responded. Again, we could spend all day in Hebrews 1.3. <laughs> it's beautiful. I hope you'll write that down. Med read, read it this week. Read it in multiple translations. Soak your mind and heart in it because it's so beautiful. But notice how Moses responded. Back to Exodus 34, verse 9. Lord, he said, if I have found favor, that's grace, the Hebrew word chain. If I have found favor, if I have found grace in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. God, you got to go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, I, I, I swear I have never said that in my prayers about you. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. How beautiful. Moses understood and desired God's presence. He, he sought forgiveness and he understood that he was God's possession. He wanted the Lord to be the most significant, most important, most weighty aspect of his life. This is a clear picture of a person who wants to glorify God. I hope, I pray, and I want you to pray for me, that I would be a pastor, that I would be a man and a husband and a father and a, and a child of God that, that lives for the glory of God. And that's really my prayer for you, for us as a church, that we would glorify God in all that we do. To glorify God is to give him the worship and reverence which are due him. This is just the appropriate response, human response to God's glory. He becomes the most significant aspect of our lives. And we want him to look good in everything that we do. You, you guys are good looking. When the chins are here, we look a little better. When, when Amir's here, you know, uh, some of us, you know, we just make, some of us, ah, the cool factor goes up. We're not trying to be cool, of course. but We understand those things, right, in human terms. And if we can think more about how God looks in our lives. We, we can, if, we, if we can just take more time to think, God, how can I make you look big in this moment? We're a sports family. We talk about it a lot, right? And, and, and the emphasis there is whatever platform you have. I mean, Bruce is, I didn't ask you if I could share this, and I won't share anything personal, but Bruce has a pretty influential job. And he, he shared with the men's group how God is working in this. There are probably a lot of people who would be envious to Bruce's position, and God is using Bruce in this position to bring glory to himself, to serve other people, to make God look great. He's taken risks in his job. He shared with us last week. Taken risks to stand up for people, to stand up for just things, to make God the one who's significant and important in that. How might that look in your life? So in similar ways, as God took, God really wanted us to understand this, so he sent his son so we could see what God's glory looked like. He, wants, he wanted to make God's glory more tangible in Jesus. He also saves us to make his glory more tangible to the world around us. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, this isn't like an authoritative thing necessarily, but it's pretty well known states this succinctly, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Man's chief end is to glorify God, to make God the most significant, weighty, important thing in our lives and enjoy him forever. I don't mean this, I'm not speaking down on you when I say this, I, I'm saying this right, <laughs> right back at me. Am I enjoying God? Think about, this past week, how have you enjoyed God? I think the two things will go hand in hand. The more we enjoy God, the more he will be glorified in and through us. If you're, at, if you're at work and you're enjoying God, even if it's difficult, you'll be able to, you'll be thinking more about how to, how to glorify him in your neighborhood. We, we say it here, we like to say net, neighborhood and network. So where you live 
and where you, where you work, where you play, where you hobby. The Bible is full of examples. We're going to close in just a minute. It's full, exa- full of examples and of how to, of, full of exhortations for us to live for his glory is what I'm trying to say. And calls God's people to live for his glory. Here are just a few that I want you, uh, by the way, anything that's on that table here, we want it to go uh, here. Uh, so if there's anything on the table, if, you, if, if you're not sure about lunch, just take a pile of food. Um, thank you all for providing. Everything's been amazing this morning. Have you enjoyed it? Did you enjoy brunch? Yeah, that was great. It was awesome. Um, so what I'm going to give you is a take-home bag of scriptures to go along with your take-home bag of food, okay? So you might want to write these down if you're taking notes. If you want to, feel free. Let's ask God to help us truly lo- live for God's glory, which is what we were meant for. Here, here's just a few examples. Like, how can we glorify God in our day-to-day life? How about this, Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, in the same way, and what he's referring to is, he says, don't cover a light with a bowl. Like, the light isn't meant to be covered, right? The light's not meant to be covered. So he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And what? How does someone, how does someone do that? So you're serving someone, you just do a good thing. Maybe you work really hard. You know, Elliot is really awesome at cleaning carpets. He, he, he got this carpet for us. So this allows me to really roam and stay on. <laughs> and when Elliot's finished cleaning a carpet, some of you have had Elliot in your home. And you already, you've experienced this, Right. Was God glorified in, I mean, I didn't ask, (laughs) hope I can say this. Um, If he did a really bad job, let us know afterwards. (laughs) But that's one way. It's like, wow, I got to know what that's, they're not necessarily, if they're not a Christian, they may not say, wow, glory to God. But they're bringing glory to God by pointing to the one who's bringing glory to God. How about this? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies, like there's something physical and spiritual, and we don't want to, we got to be careful to understand the connection, right? Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. I mean, explicit, right? We're not, (laughs) this isn't Pastor Ed's message. Like, you know, we're not our own. Paul said it. You were bought at a high price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We don't talk about this very much. Not enough. I I think our series, when we we did the Daniel fast, we we try to talk about this every year in terms of fasting. By the way, this this isn't to shame any, this isn't about what you look like. Okay, so this isn't to shame anybody. The, The idea is that we're just striving so that in every aspect of our life, God is glorified, just as we, think, as we think through these things. How can God be honored in our bodies? I love this, 1 Corinthians 10, 1, 10 31. Like, is God only present in church services when we sing? Listen to what Paul says. So whether you... I, one minute left. One minute, one minute left here, okay? And so whether you eat or drink, we did this this morning, right? <laughs> whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. By the way, in Greek, whatever you do is the same thing in English, like whatever you do. You don't have to understand. It's nothing fancy. Whatever you do. So if you're wondering, well, is it when I'm fishing, when I'm, when I'm walking my baby, when I'm nursing my baby, when, when I'm, you know, whatever, crunching numbers, <laughs> whatever you do, do it all For the glory of God. So that God is the one that looks big. Colossians 3.17. Again, same Greek word. Whatever you do. That's pretty much everything. Whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's the same idea as his glory. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. A few verses later, same chapter, Colossians 3. 23 and 24, whatever you do, again, God's not wrapped up into, is it at church, is it at work, is it in the neighborhood, 
It's kind of all of that. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, whether you're vacuuming or cleaning or singing or Brazilian jiu-jitsuing or next Sunday I'm going to be running a lot. Do it all. Do it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ whom you are serving. Two more. First Peter 4, 11, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised. In all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? I hope God is just using his word to speak to us. Finally, I previously quoted, we started the message with this, but I want to read it again. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Brothers and sisters, our God is so worthy. I hope you've seen just a glimpse of it this morning. I hope you'll take these scriptures and even uh, dig back into them on your own, share them, talk about them around tables, talk about them after service, before service, throughout the week. May we glorify God. May we make a big deal of Him this week. And when we fail, uh, by the way, we fail at this every day. (laughs) Every day, I mean, there, there's not a day that, that I, uh, there's not a day that goes by where I wake up and I'm like, boing, God's glory, yes, everything, coffee, glorify God as I'm making coffee, and at breakfast, you know, and it's throughout the whole day, every single thing. No, we, we fail, and that's where we are thankful that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's this dual, this is the Christian faith, right? Faith, the, the Christian life, faith. Aligning our mind, emotions, and will to what God says. And then repentance when we, when we fall. Just this daily life. That's life with God. It's a life of faith and repentance. It's not, all, it's not all lined up perfectly. It doesn't always make sense. There's a lot of confusion in it. There's a lot of ambiguity in life with God, isn't there? And maybe some of you feel that more heavily this morning than others. May we enthrone God with all of our affections and love in everything that we do. And again, when we fail, may his kindness lead us to repentance and back into his gracious, merciful, and compassionate arms. I'm going to pray, and then uh, we're going to have a special treat as Amir and Elliot will lead us. And let's sing and worship. If you need prayer, uh, grab someone next to you or in front of you or behind you. I'll be right over here if you want um, to have a few minutes of prayer. And then afterwards, uh, we'll wrap up after we sing a few songs. But let's pray before we do.